Anna Lynn Fors is a biohacking sexologist and psychologist who is currently specializing in sexological therapy, especially trauma care. Through her profession, Anna sees how prevalent challenges with sexual health are, meaning we all experience them. Her passion is to promote sexual health as a part of holistic well-being and to bring back pleasure to all areas of life. Anna's holistic approach for well-being stems from her professional and personal adventures, for example, researching integrative therapy in Spain, reflecting on humanity while supporting inmates in a rehabilitation program in a Brazilian youth prison, and now working both in preventative health care, health optimization, as well as in a therapeutic context in Finland and internationally. Anna, welcome to the Biohacking Secrets Show. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a while, so it's good to catch up. It's been a while. Uh, we last ran into each other in, in November of 2019, so almost two years ago at the, uh, the like after party for the Biohacker Summit in Helsinki, Finland. And there was yep. DJing going on with like big psychedelic imagery behind it. They had saunas. There was uh, beach volleyball. People were surfing indoor waves. It was, it was a wild time. And that was when we first connected. Yeah. And I've, I've been blessed to see a lot of your journey these past few years and like some of the things that you've been doing yourself and with clients to help people like reconnect to a love for life, a love for self, and in turn, how that affects our relationships. So before we like really dive into sexual health, maybe you could take us through a little bit of your journey and how you kind of went down this path. Oh, wow. Prepare for a long one. Um, (laughs) But so basically, well, my journey into sexology started already when I was in high school. So during that time, I was um, in Finland, you choose the kind of subjects that you specialize in and um, health sciences was one that I did. And um, we had a project, we could choose a project that we wanted to do like a study in. Um, Everyone else basically chose alcohol, drugs, (laughs) or um, tobacco or weed or something like that. And then I was like, wait a minute, like, what, what do I want to study? And then at that time, there were a lot of relationship challenges and, and um, well, I could see around me a lot of, um, you know, bad sexual experiences and, and even traumas. And, um, and I thought to myself, like, okay, How do our sexual experiences and sexuality impact our self-esteem? And I I told my teacher, like, hey, this is what I want to study. And she told me it was crazy. Um, So I went ahead with it. And um, it was amazing (laughs) Uh, what we found out. It's like it really does impact your self-esteem. And um, and, uh, at the time, I realized when I did background research for it that um, there wasn't really much information um, so I said to my friends as a joke, like, hey, <laughs> you know what, I might as well just end up as a sexologist. Um, and then I went ahead, I studied psychology in Scotland, and I got my degree there, and then started specializing in, in clinical sexology. And um, that's what I'm doing. I'm now in my second year, um, and I'm specializing in sexological therapy, and especially trauma. So I would say that Right now, um, throughout my work week, I get to see uh, a broad range of humanity. So from preventive healthcare and like health optimization and this biohacking um, environment to then trauma um, in the like therapeutic context and, you know, very deep, um, intimate and especially like emotionally intimate stuff. Um, and it's, it's very touching. Um, to to kind of see the range but at the same time it's very rewarding to Mm -hmm. get to see people rebuild themselves and and start to flourish again Um, totally totally they get that sparkle back and um, that's why i do it yeah yeah beautiful i mean I, i reflect a lot on how like when you go back to let's say the the Ad, the advent of agriculture and then more specifically like transportation where you started seeing this trend of uh, men 
going away from the home to work all day, you know, in these jobs, they'd come home exhausted. And a lot of times, like they're giving everything to their work now because they're going to cities to earn a living and then they're coming back home. And it's, it, it's, it, it affected the way that partners were able to connect and be intimate with one another, especially if you like contrast that versus just kind of managing a homestead and growing some of your own food and you're working in tandem with your partner all day. Um, what, what have you kind of seen in how, uh, how has sex with the general population changed in the past hundred years? And, and what are some of the things that you think, like, what are the biggest pain points that could be improved upon to, for people to connect more deeply with their partner or partners? Wow, that is a, a broad question. Um, I'll do my best to answer, but um, well, we've seen a massive shift in the, the way that people um, explore their sexuality or enact it in, in different ways. Um, we're going more from this conservative viewpoint to more maybe a more liberal and and in many ways people feel more more free to go outside the kind of heteronormative norm um but the biggest challenge is i would say is that right now we're we're going through a massive um poor sexual health epidemic that no one's talking about it um many studies have found that approximately 40% or even half of women um, experience some sort of sexual dysfunction. The most common are basically um, challenges with arousal, either too low or too high, um, challenges with desire, often too low or too high, um, challenges having an orgasm or just pleasure in general and experiencing pain during sex. And then if you look at men, the number is... Um, almost up to 60%. Obviously it changes um, throughout lifetime. And uh, there's a lot of challenges with erection, ejaculation, this kind of, um, I don't like to use the term, well, performance. I was just thinking so, um, this need in, to perform. In, exactly. So there's a lot of pressure there. And mm -hmm. um, you know, now with the modern day technology, social media, all that kind of stuff, we get the dopamine and the reward from there. So there's less interest um, in having sex in, in general. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, what I would say is like, when we see these challenges, and like, in reality, if we look at that, um, that's, that's half of the people Mm -hmm. living on this earth who are experiencing these massive challenges. And, and those are the kind of challenges that go beyond, beyond some threshold. And challenges with one of the primary ways we really connect and reestablish, exactly. uh, you know, intimacy with our partner. Yeah, our partner and ourselves, because mm -hmm. sexual health is such an important part of our well-being. Mm -hmm. um, and we really need to dive deep and look into these um these issues and like what are causing them and um often often what i see is that um there's trauma trauma mm -hmm. in in some form um and then when i say trauma especially in this in a sexual um, context people immediately think about okay sexual violence or these kind of atrocities but you know trauma can come from even just like one look because this is such a, you know, primitive and like sensitive and intimate topic. So for example, um, I, well, I can share this anonymously, but um, there, there was a woman who, um, I don't know how, how openly can we use terms here when we talk about sex? Anything. Okay. <laughs> just just yeah. wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. Basically like she was having sex with her partner and um and he was going down on her. Um, but the thing is like, he had a cold. So he was like, he was sniffing like, uh, like this with his nose um, because, well, because he had, he had a runny nose. And then mm -hmm. she interpreted that as, oh my God, there's something wrong with me. Like, like I smell do, do I smell, do I look, do I look bad? Mm -hmm. And she just closed off. She, mm -hmm. she couldn't have sex mm -hmm. at all, um, especially oral sex. And, and that created a massive trauma for her. 
and then to start working on that and and um rebuilding that relationship with yourself but but also with your partner so that you're able to have open communication and 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 talk about this stuff and and ask about like hey why did you why did you you know breathe this way or why did you do mm-hmm. that and then and then when you do that you're able to well heal that trauma but also prevent further traumas mm-hmm. and i think i think with trauma it, it is important for us to be more open about this and to 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 recognize that trauma isn't necessarily something that everybody would recognize as a traumatic event it's exactly. it's relative to how it impacted you emotionally and i think that like i remember back in in junior high there was like a group of our friends and when it came to uh pornography like the first naked woman i saw was my friend's dad's playboy and then like a group of us like all like threw in a couple bucks and we had a guy like buy us a, a little um magazine that had naked women in it and we were Mm -hmm. all so terrified for our parents to find it that we like would put it in a plastic bag and bury it in the woods and then like you know look at it when we were together and stuff like that and then now you've got pornography all over the internet and you've got so Mm -hmm. many men and women who are like okay they're learning about sex through these pornographic videos many of which have like embedded trauma in them there's like exactly stepmom porn and there's, you know, extremely, extremely rough sex. And then you start to understand, like, is, is it any surprise why women are in pain during sex? Like, yes, there could mm-hmm. be something going on with the woman, but it could also be a man who's been watching like women just get pounded in a way that no woman wants to have sex. And they're like, I guess that's what it is, you know, kind of monkey see monkey yeah. do. And, and, and how do you feel pornography impacts sexual health and, um, and and the human psychology? Well, um, I think porn is a pretty well controversial topic in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in one way it allows um, people to enact their sexual fantasies that they're they otherwise couldn't and and there's this kind of aspect to it which mm. can be seen as a as a benefit mm. but then so i would say that porn is for entertainment and it's something to explore when it comes a problem is when it is your only source of sex ed when you look yeah. for information there you're like oh how do I have sex? How do I, how do I do this? What, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And, and you go and you see, you know, whatever that, that you think like, okay, that's disturbing. Okay. That's apparently what I need to do. Um, and then you go and do it and um, you might not enjoy it. Your partner might not enjoy. Um, and also another aspect that's a problematic with porn is that it's very, well, um, most, well, I don't want to say mostly men, watch porn but men are the majority who watch porn so Certainly obviously more than women. Porn, yeah so porn is directed um for male pleasure um mm-hmm. and the way you know the, the the scenery and how it's filmed and and um and all the kind of stuff is is made for the male viewer um so what about women's pleasure mm-hmm. men who watch porn to get sex ed like what do they know about women's pleasure Mm -hmm. not much um so we definitely need to change the narrative not only around porn but um around sex because right now it's it's very narrow Mm -hmm. if we look at heter like heteronormative sex it's very um intercourse um centered or penis centered so Mm -hmm. there's like you know let's say there's foreplay oral sex whatever sexting you know talking about whatever you want and this kind of aspect and then there's like the wow intercourse and then mm-hmm. that's that's seen as like the sex mm-hmm. and then after play mm-hmm. but if you look at um the percentage of women who experience an orgasm from penetrative penetrative sex only that's around 20 percent. so mm-hmm. one in five women it's no wonder that around 70% of women fake an orgasm. That's and many no are, true. 
or that is true? No, it's no wonder. Oh, no because wonder. Of, yeah. Because because of the narrative um, yeah. that we have around sex and these expectations. Um, so definitely there are a lot of challenges that um, people experience. And the question is what to do about them or like mm-hmm. how can someone improve their sex life? For sure. And there's totally different biology between men and women. Like men, a lot of times can look at a photo and be, you know, quote unquote, aroused and ready to go. Mm -hmm. And women, it just takes much, much longer. So if like, as a man, if you're only paying attention to your arousal threshold, she's probably 20 to 30 minutes behind you. (laughs) And, uh, and and then especially if you're, if there's, you know, foreplay and things like that being skipped, or even just like something like massage where Mm -hmm. a woman's able to anticipate that, that something sexual is coming and she's able to relax Mm -hmm. and and feel Mm -hmm. like she's in a safe environment. You know, it's, it's a lot different. Um, I also, you know, just from uh, before we kind of close out on pornography, I think that there's, our brains have a very hard time telling the difference between something that we see or imagine Mm -hmm. and reality. And what, if you kind of look at it from a primitive standpoint, like, a monkey that sits there watching another, like a male monkey that sits there watching another male monkey have sex with a female is typically the beta. Or, you know, if you want to mm. get fancy, like, you know, you can yeah, get into like bad. gamma and whatnot. But if, if, if as a men, if we're sitting around watching a lot of pornography, our brain can't tell the mm. difference. And your hormones, your psychology, everything, your subconscious mind start thinking that you're beta. And it's very easy to fall into a pattern where uh, not only do you engage in beta beta behavior, it, it, you engage in these laziness loops where you're watching porn. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if, if it, it affects whether or not you approach a woman that you're interested in or whether or not you engage in assertive behavior that is often, you know, as long as it's done uh, consensually and in a healthy way, important for having sexual relationships in the real world, you know, not mm-hmm. the, the, the inverted reality of the internet, you know? Um, but I do think looking at pornography as, as entertainment done sparingly and being aware of all the ways that it can draw us in and, and negatively affect our life in the real world is, is super important. Um, exactly. But the challenge is that then um, I was actually in Spain. Um, I had many like discussions um, around this topic and um, the primary source for sex ed that people said was porn. Yeah. Especially teens. So that's when it becomes an issue. And I think we definitely need more, um, you know, discussion around this topic and normalization and um, simply just like allowing people the space to develop their sexual identities um, Mm -hmm. without that kind of shame and um, restriction, Mm -hmm. I'd say. Yeah. And being okay, having these conversations in real life too. Um, Exactly. Yeah. I mean, okay. Okay. I like that. Um, How would you like, how do you look at, or how do you define sexual health? And then, um, what, what is someone who's sexually healthy? And then what are some of the ways that we can biohack it? Wow. I love that you asked that. Um, I mean, cause like to most people, when, you, when someone says the word sexual health, they think of, think about STDs, sex techniques, um, <laughs> you know, preventing pregnancies, you know, stuff like that. But yeah. it's so much more. It's such an important part of your identity, your well-being. You know, it comes down to your body image, your relationship with yourself, your sexual self-concept, your relationships with others, whether they're romantic, sexual, friendly, um, your attachment, like attachment Mm -hmm. styles with your parents and romantic relationships, um, Mm -hmm. how open you are to like really sensing with your body and um, in tune with your emotions and and stuff like that, because... um, a lot of people aren't, and and that that's a problem. But um, a sexually healthy person, I would say, someone who is holistically healthy. And um, 
I think we should integrate sexual health as part of holistic well-being, not as something like as a separate thing or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone once said that um, sexual health is the dirty bastard child of the wellness industry that no one wants to Mm. talk about, but everyone knows that it's there. So we need to, we need to bring that child back into the center and Mm -hmm. we need to talk about this stuff, um, normalize it and um, allow people to really work on it, start Mm -hmm. that process of healing. And um, it takes time, but um, we're doing important work here now discussing about this stuff. For sure. You brought up something kind of interesting, which is attachment styles. And I think that ties into the recognition of how much our relationships, like our primary relationships with our mother and our primary relationship with our father affect us um, as we go into sexual relationships. It's easy for their, if there's abandonment issues or, or especially if there's, if there's any sort of inappropriate sexual behavior that, that took place, exactly. you know, with, within our family that can, that can affect us. And a lot of times like we're, um, we're taught to distract and sedate and ignore mm-hmm. and just kind of like keep moving forward and check the boxes, you know, find a partner, get married, make babies. Mm-hmm. But if we don't really reflect on how our childhood and, and the resulting attachment styles, uh, you know, whether they're nature or nurture impact our relationships going forward, we're kind of like walking through life with uh, a pirate patch on one of our eyes. You know, like exactly. we're not we're not seeing the whole picture and how that um, how that's affecting you know our our relationships. What are some of the different attachment styles, or um, you know, some of the things that you see most commonly hold people back, if if unrecognized, unconscious, or unaddressed? Well, you know, um, well, there's avoidant attachment style, so someone like scared of intimacy, very independent. You wouldn't, like if you if you saw them, you would think like, wow, they're amazing. They're doing all these cool stuff. Um, and then you get close to them and they pull away immediately mm-hmm. um, and they they can't let anyone close. So that's a, that's a challenge. Um, often men um, portray avoidant attachment style. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's anxious attachment style, which is like someone who's constantly needing and, and like needing validation and um, and seeking for that and kind of feeling um, not like betrayed, but bitter um, and feeling like not re- receiving enough love and, and that their people around them don't really love them. Um, and that is a challenge. And, and what is interesting is often these kinds of people end up together in a relationship and that creates challenges because here is someone who is constantly needing validation um, and constantly looking for that feedback and like, love me, show me. And they would start fights to, to, to get that validation. And then here's another person who escapes when things get too emotional, they, they pull away. Mm-hmm. And you can you can really see the patterns in in relationships. Yeah. And then when when he pulls away, she feels unloved, she feels betrayed, and she becomes bitter. And then when he com- when he tries to come back, and then she's you know offended and and attacking and like you know it's this kind of not like cat and mouse play. <laughs> um, if you want to go more like deeply into attachment styles, then there's disorganized, which is a combination of the two. And that is, that is very challenging when you're forming an intimate relationship, but ultimately the goal is to form a secure attachment. So you are independent on your own, um, but you're interindependent um, together with your partner. So you are able to receive help, give help, um, communicate openly, set boundaries, um, not just sexually, but in, in all areas of your relationship. Um, but the good thing is that um, your attachment style is not fixed. They are flexible and you could work on that. Um, it might not be easy, but um, there's hope there. So if you feel like you're, you're um, like trapped in these toxic behavior patterns or like you notice that you're always looking for a similar 
um, type of partner who who kind of like let's say you're an um, anxious attachment and you're always looking for avoidant attachment and you wonder like okay why do they always pull away what am I doing wrong mm -hmm. um, it could be simply that there is a mismatch um, but at the same time if you put two anxious people together that's a that's a trauma bond about to explode so <laughs> yeah yeah it's one of um a song that i really enjoy is uh by mike posner and it's i took a, a pill in a pizza that's a lot of people yeah. recognize it's like i took a pill in a pizza <laughs> to show a vg i was cool yeah. and and um but i really enjoyed the song because there were moments of very vulnerable honesty in it and, and especially mm -hmm. ones that like i resonated with when it came out you know and one of the lines in like the second verse he says and I can't keep a girl, no, because as soon as the sun comes up, I cut them all loose and work is my excuse, but the truth is I can't open up. And it exactly. was that recognition of like, how as men, you know, what, what I resonated with and what I recognized in myself was that I was getting very comfortable um, with surface level relationships. Hmm. And I was wondering why I almost had an inclination to repeat the early courtship process, like yeah. up to sex. And then it was like, all right, I'm comfortable here. So I'm just going to start over with someone else, you know, rather than looking at like the fact that most of the time our relationships as we get to know the other person as we get comfortable with the other person as we can we feel safe that like we can surrender and like we can exactly. be vulnerable together wow. different wow. levels start to open up you know and um we can justify it in so many different ways you know for in the in the song it was work for other people it's ah now nah, we just didn't click i'm just not that ender you know what i mean or or whatever but there's all the, this depth that we don't get to explore and enjoy and allow to, you know, come, come through if we're afraid to open up ourselves, you know, exactly. And, and, and I love, yeah, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. Um, no, I, I just, I love that you said the word surrender. I think it's one of the biggest things that I've noticed with, with, women if a woman is comfortable surrendering and she trusts you as a man and feels safe it's mm -hmm. like if that's not the case there's no technique that that you know is going to like do anything magical in the bedroom exactly but if she so does feel that way you can like almost flounder around in bed and she'll have a great experience yeah because the thing is that active surrender can be very empowering mm -hmm. but that requires a, a safe space um for sex and when you talked about attachment styles and you know these kind of different toxic behavior patterns that people um do um those are trauma coping mechanisms and mm -hmm. what you mentioned about yeah you got hooked to the the to chase so mm -hmm. you were always like chasing but then when you got what you wanted so to speak um you weren't ready to surrender and mm -hmm. really get to know that one but you were like okay this is getting too much i i need to get out oh trauma trauma coping mechanism like mm -hmm. that's when it kicks in you take set, steps back and then you start the process again mm -hmm. and that's just your ego keeping you safe that's your coping mechanism but you need to do the work to be able to surrender and you need to do the work within, but you also need to find a partner who is working on themselves, who are healing their trauma, working on their coping mechanisms, um, reflecting on and, and looking to do self-growth and, and to be able to surrender. Mm -hmm. And then together you can create that safe space. Mm -hmm. You need to have that within so that you can share that with someone else. Mm -hmm. But then when you do, that can be so powerful. 
Mm-hmm. Like that's that's when sex is at its core. Active surrender and this well, like playful energy. So when when you are in a comfortable place with yourself and um well, this kind of goes into then like feminine energy and masculine energy and and playing around those and with um uh, surrendering and and dominating um but then uh, like many people confuse surrender with submission Mm. and those are very different um concepts Mm -hmm. submission is is passive Mm -hmm. and that can be seen like okay now you're being dominated so Mm -hmm. you're um in submission or you're you know submissive to this but um you know, then like this active form of surrender is is very empowering. And um, especially uh, when both partners are comfortable with their, both their masculine energy and, and feminine energy, they can play around that and switch. Like, okay, mm-hmm. now I'm dominating and I'm, I'm taking this power and like, I let you surrender and then mm-hmm. you do the same for me. And it's very playful. It's, it's natural. And that way, both partners can live their through um, authentic selves mm-hmm. in that when they are comfortable with that play. Um, mm-hmm. But but if you're stuck, if a man is stuck in that masculine energy, you know you you have to be the the provider, dominant, motivated, um, you know all that kind of stuff. How mm-hmm. can how can you surrender? Mm-hmm. Because often people talk about surrender when it comes to women, but mm-hmm. men need that too. We all have that masculine feminine energy, but then also for women, you know, feminine energy is like very creative, innovative, feeling sensual, um, playful. Um, and many women suppress that because, uh, because they feel like, okay, I need to be masculine in order to be taken seriously. I need to do this. And, you know, there are a lot of women in like high performance jobs and they have their career, their families, their work, like everything's externally, everything's perfect, but internally they feel very lost, mm-hmm. um, very lost with their pleasure. Um, and it's, it's just like, then when you start to open that box, you start to look into your feminine energy and, and, and start to feel that flow. Um, it's not an easy journey, but it can be very empowering and that can really change your relationship. Yeah. Same it's, with it's men. For sure. It's completely different than, you know, the, the business owner who's like constantly needs to be the boss constantly needs to be on his game and, and never really feels like he has space in his life or nor has he created space in his life to, to be more mm-hmm. feminine. Uh, so that then when he goes into sexual encounters, you know, he wants to be submissive and wants to be mm-hmm. dominated or the other way around where you've got like a woman who feels like she's constantly in her masculine energy because she's expected to have a career and she's, you know, and so on and so forth. And then it's com- it, this isn't a compensatory mechanism. It's more so shining a light on holes in your life maybe building a more well-rounded life where there is space for the energy that is deficient and, and also shining a light on some of the observations or traumas and experiences that could be contributing to our tendencies, you know, so that there's, there's space for both of those for there's a lot of trauma that, and past experiences that is unconscious, right? Mm -hmm. Like I realized a while ago, not, actually, it wasn't that long ago. I was like, wow, my primary model of of marriage is my parents who are like, they're still together. But, mm-hmm. you know, I look at it today and like my dad has Parkinson's and there's not a lot of like love expressed between them. And, and mm-hmm. you know, a little bit back, I was like, fuck, I'm afraid of marriage because I don't want what they have. Yeah. You know, I don't want like what I've, what I'm seeing in my parents to be my future. And then if I make a commitment, it's important to me. Like if I say till death do us part, we're going to do that. Mm. But yeah. I also don't want to feel like I'm in this loveless lifelong commitment, 
you know? Mm-hmm. So it was important for me to even realize that it, it wasn't, it wasn't conscious. Do you have any methods for people to start shining a light on some of their belief patterns or traumas that could be subconsciously affecting their relationships and, and sexual health? Well, to, to get to the subconscious, um, first you need to be willing to do the work. Um, it can be like, it can be very scary and your ego has very good defense mechanisms and to, to keep you on this like performance level life. Mm -hmm. Um, so first you need to be willing to look into the mirror Mm -hmm. and see yourself. That's, that's really the first step, but that's, um, that's too scary for a lot of people, but then then to get to the next stage, it's like, I would say that start reflecting on, just take time, sit down, reflect on, journal, work on, meditate, do different kinds of activities or um, seek a, like professional help. There are plenty of amazing, you know, professionals, therapists with trauma experience um, that can help you like process these and, and discuss different aspects many people have um childhood trauma that they're not aware of um that then leads to toxic behavior patterns and then they go to therapy and they realize like wait okay so this is what this is why i've been living this way my whole life and it can be very life-changing um in that sense but really it's about um the thing is, because like, I don't think that there is any easy way. I know that's not what you asked, but there's no easy way to get to your subconscious. Um, well, there are some like psychedelics and, and meditation and like accessing that subconscious mind. But I think it's really about being willing to do the work. Mm-hmm. Look into the mirror, see yourself and start rebuilding yourself, your true authentic self. Yeah. There has to be the intention to better Mm -hmm. understand yourself and like, and then, and then with that intention, you know, so you can, you can start with the patterns and you can say, all right, why, why is this a pattern that I keep repeating? Mm -hmm. Or what are my beliefs around sexual health? What are my beliefs around marriage? Where did they come exactly. from? You know, asking exactly. the right questions and then, and then combining that with either. Yeah. Like you said, talking to someone, hiring mm-hmm. someone that you can express this stuff to, if you don't want it, like if you want to hide from it, you're never going to get there. So like that intention has to be there, exactly. but then, then you got to allow the energy to move and kind of almost sift through all the junk to get to the little nugget where you have the aha moment and, and questions and journaling can help if you want something that's like affordable, you know, Julia Cameron, at least to my knowledge, came up with this journaling technique called the morning pages where like, you just write nonstop, like no punctuation. You just keep the, the pen or pencil going and you fill, she says three pages, right? But that's one way that energy can move if your intention is there and can allow you to gain insights. Like if you're doing that every Mm. morning and just keeping the pen moving and letting stuff that's inside of you out, you'll start having some, some insights. And then there's also therapy, as you mentioned, if, if you have a budget for that, um, it's probably not something you want to like do with your best friend over coffee. Cause he or she is going to yeah. <laughs> eventually start asking you for money. But I do think all of that can help and, and practices that mm-hmm. enhance consciousness, like meditation, like certain, like certain plant medicines and psychedelics mm-hmm. that can a- allow you to access different parts of your brain. Um, can also be super, super helpful. We're going to, in a moment, talk about some of the ways to bring back pleasure in all areas of our life. But Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of ask first, because there's this term that's been around now for a few years uh, of fuck boys. And it seems like like it's something that's like becoming, I don't, I don't know if it's increasingly common or just, it's like on the internet a little bit more, but um, (laughs) I know that I know that it seems to be more of an issue, especially with like the younger generation. So maybe mm. for our listeners who aren't familiar, like you can define what what is a fuck boy, and then we'll talk about like how not to be one. 
Wow. Well, um, I personally don't like to use the term fuckboy, but it's often used, well, a fuckboy to describe often a young man who uses women, um, you know, texts you, ghost you, fucks you, ghost you. Well, fuckboy, that's literally where it comes from, like has sex and then disappears. And yeah, basically just um, a young man who uses women for their own pleasure without regards to others feelings mm -hmm. that's how i would um describe a fuck boy um but what i see is uh when someone is being a fuck boy um there's often trauma behind that that's a trauma coping mechanism maybe avoid an attachment style mm -hmm. um you know or feeling that ego need or whatever there's you know there's always um something behind there mm -hmm. uh, but what i do want to say like saying this is like um for all the women out there dealing with fuck boys it's like you can understand someone and you can understand why they're doing something but it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you need to accept what they're doing to you or like you don't have the right for your boundaries so i mm -hmm. just want to highlight this that um sure and, yeah. and i think that that also can you know, it perpetuates the the trauma cycle or the trauma loop because exactly. you, know, you have you have this wounded boy who then, mm -hmm. you know, seduces or pursues a woman long enough to have sex with her and then disappears. And then the woman starts learning each time I'm like the most vulnerable I could be, the person I like then disappears, you know, and exactly. and, and and it can keep us in a in a very um immature sexual pattern on both sides you know yeah. so are, are there i guess first and foremost are there ways that what's the opposite of a fuck boy uh i would say emotionally mature man mm -hmm. that's what i would say yeah like in, in touch with uh, his emotions and willing to work on themselves being able to create a safe relationship with someone mm -hmm. and when i say like create a uh, a safe relationship with someone i'm not talking about the length of the relationship you know yeah. you can have a one night stand and that can be very consensual um mm -hmm. respectful and pleasurable to all parties mm -hmm. there doesn't have to be hurt um in there but um often when people come from these um trauma coping mechanisms then they end up hurting people mm -hmm. yeah and, definitely. and hurt and hurt the word uh, well the phrase hurt people hurt people uh, yeah it's very valid in, in my opinion definitely and healed people heal people um, yeah. yeah yeah there was i was talking to a friend the other day and she mentioned her sister one of the things that she kind of had to she found that when her husband was working too much or stressed out because of work or finances or other situations like that, sometimes when they were having sex, he would almost use her as mm. a, an outlet and because he didn't have other ways of expressing his frustration or, you know, the fact that he felt he was overworked or, um, you know, experiencing a challenge in some other area of his life, he would take it out in the bedroom. And she had mm -hmm. to kind of have a conversation with him and say, hey, I, I noticed there's a very different emotional experience here when you're going through mm -hmm. something at work or, you know, in your life. And I'm not comfortable with being the person that you take that out on in bed. Right. Wow. So like when we're talking about some of these unhealthy patterns, it's not just, it's not just like a, a Gen Z or Gen X or whatever it is, okay. you know, it's it, inter everywhere. internet generation thing. It can be everywhere. So it's like, mm. it's the recognition that like, there's a little bit of that fuck boy behavior that could be present in mm. all of us and yeah. be more it can trigger, you know, yeah. stress yeah. often triggers these unhealthy behavior patterns. But yeah. what I do want to say is that um, I loved how she had healthy boundary setting and, and communication. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, cause then 
there's a lot of talk on the internet about fuck boys and and doing like well, well everything relating that phenomenon mm -hmm. but really we need to look at all individuals mm -hmm. and um how they enact their sexuality and like how they nurtured their sexual health mm -hmm. um boundaries is key mm -hmm. Bo like boundaries communication but in order to to have boundaries to set boundaries and communicate them and to communicate your desire and and pleasure and and um and all those aspects you need to know yourself you need mm -hmm. to have a healthy relationship with yourself and often those kind of um well people pleasing behaviors and like people break their boundaries um as a result of of trauma or they're looking for validation um and stuff like that especially young people but it you know like you said it's not just young people's issue it's it's across all ages um mm -hmm. but the there's something about sex and sexuality because it is such a taboo and there's so much shame so it's almost like people attach their identity or capabilities to how they perform sex and then this comes down to setting boundaries and communication it's like people are afraid to set a boundary because they're afraid of rejection mm -hmm. they're afraid like okay <gasps> mm. am i not loved am i not accepted oh if what if i say no what how's if she I say gonna that? respond oh, I, what's he yeah do? i don't like that mm -hmm. what are they gonna do um and that's a key issue that we need to address Mm -hmm. um and you know that comes from processing your trauma building a relationship with yourself and then like really finding your boundaries a lot of people don't know or it's not something that they've spent time um thinking about so. mm -hmm. let's um we'll go a little bit more specific before we go a little more general so um <laughs> for men and women that would like to have more orgasms mm -hmm. better orgasms um what are some of the the simple things that they could do and then of course i know there's going to be some more complicated things but for, <laughs> for people that want to have full body orgasms or stronger orgasms or, or longer orgasms or just more you know where where do they start well, funnily enough, I would just change the whole narrative around sex mm -hmm. to go away from that orgasm centric and performance centric to communication centric and, and pleasure centric. Mm. So it's not about did you orgasm? It's mm -hmm. more about how did this feel for you? Mm. Was it pleasurable? How pleasurable was this for you? Mm -hmm. And then you open your body to being sensual to being sexual and um and really i mean also if we if we think about women's pleasure and we go there for a bit mm -hmm. um no one even knows how many types of female orgasms there are i know and that's like a I know. you know it's like because people think one <laughs> vaginal yeah. orgasm that's the one did you yeah. orgasm that's you know that's that's what people think and it's like how about we expand from that you know your whole body is a pleasure playground and your mm -hmm. largest sexual organ is your brain mm -hmm. you know if if you want to have you know mind blowing orgasms expand your sexuality from the bedroom to all areas of your life mm -hmm. you know like be sensual and and feel that warm water when you take a shower and enjoy it when you go outside pause to really feel feel like sunlight on your skin um if you have a partner you know maybe send them a, a text during the day you're like i'm thinking of you and like add mm -hmm. that playfulness to your life not a not a dick pic guys not a dick pic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well not unsolicited ones I not think unsolicited people, people can do whatever they want to do but yeah 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 unsolicited. um 
but yeah, just because like a lot of people um, perform life, mm -hmm. they don't enjoy their life. Like they don't live their lives. They perform lives according to a culture, like culturally um, determined, like a uh, script. And that performance that's, that's, mindset can keep you from feeling. Exactly. And that, that applies to sex. Mm -hmm. It's like how people have sex. It's like, it's this cultural norm. For Before sure. play, intercourse, maybe after play. Um, some don't totally. even do that. So, so really just to open your mind to exploring and yeah. like bring back play into sex and, and yeah. sexuality and um and being tuned in enough to feel like while you're in the act like i i mean i remember i used to be like i i had a very head head centered approach you know mm -hmm. and i'd be i'd be like okay kiss her neck now breathe in her ear yeah. now kiss her nipples now kiss her in her thighs and it was like yeah yeah it was doing the things but it was still a loop and it was yeah, still, it was, it was still, still performance very, oriented. It was still yeah. performance oriented, you know? And it's like, it, when you, you can still do those things, but if you're like feeling it out and actually like paying attention to how the other person's responding, they'll give you signals on what they like and what, mm -hmm. you know, they want exactly. more of. And it's not this like general loop of things that most women or men enjoy yeah. you know there's this hilarious scene um my brother used to he was like really into that show friends growing up oh i love that show <laughs> and there's there's one scene where i don't even remember the whole conversation but monica is like talking about the like the seven erogenous zones yeah of women and oh, i think i love that i love that <laughs> and she's like okay she's like you start with a one and then you yeah. work your way up to a three and then a two and then a six and then a five and then a seven and a seven and a seven. <laughs> she's like she's getting really really into it you know and like some of the guys are mind blown because they didn't even realize that there were that many erogenous zones and and whatnot exactly. and like you know that approach it gets you so far but at a certain point like you're going to find pro you're probably going to find yourself craving a more heart-centered approach and a more tuned in approach and one where it's a little bit more like improvisational and like playing exactly playing jazz rather than you know following an exact uh musical script well, exactly you, you've and touched also on the, just like yeah. mindful presence yeah you know it's like if you're thinking about um doing the dishes while you're having sex you're very unlikely to have an orgasm mm -hmm. so also just like allowing yourself to be present with your partner with yeah. yourself and and open to those experiences like sensual like sensually sexually just um just be there mm -hmm. and that yeah. is foreign to many um because uh because of the culture that we live in it's like this 24 7 you go 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 you yeah. do this multitasking all this kind of stuff um and i think we need to take a step back and um you know get closer to ourselves mm -hmm. and, and our partners and um, for sure. And, and just general. like we, we budget our time for work and workouts and like some people make exactly. some meal prep and this and that. And like, we don't, we don't <laughs> carve out enough time for sex, sex and just overall pleasure activities mm -hmm. where like, I think so many couples, like I was just in, in Mexico for one of my close friends weddings and I, I saw so many couples like getting massages and stuff like that and there was a part of me that's like y'all are like living together and you're in the same room together like give mm. each other a massage it's going to be better than like some random person at the hotel rubbing you down you know and then oh yeah and you get to have sex after you know but it, 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 but exactly. i don't i don't think there's enough touch and then you know you throw kids into the mix and this mm. and that and it's easy to just like oh my god we're having sex like once a week and it's a quickie and i wonder exactly. why we don't feel the same connection we felt when it was just the two of us and we'd have these like you know sex in the city marathons well <laughs> while while having sex ourselves like five times in a day it's like oh yeah because yeah, like the the time that you've 
allotted and carved out for this has has reduced by tenfold, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, when I was in Spain and we, we studied this um, integrative therapy, that was a very um, profound wake-up call to me in, in so many ways. And I understood the importance of touch. Like touch as in, I mean, sexual touch, obviously, but like non-sexual touch uh, as part of well-being. And um, especially during these times, people are very foreign to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously there, you know, when you, when you meet people, you need to be careful. But just as kind of like with your partner, add more touch, not to sexual, but like, you know, touch each other, hug each other, be, be close, because that can be very powerful on its own. Just that physical closeness. Mm -hmm. um, look into each other's eyes. I know it sounds so simple, mm -hmm. but it's so powerful. Yeah. Especially with all of our devices. Yeah, yeah. There's like, there's, there's a lot of eye aversion, especially yeah. with the younger generations. And, and it's, I mean, I remember I was, I went through second cities improvisational comedy, like training program, like a through E. And one of the things they had us do early on was you had to just sit with, and this was with a stranger and you had to yeah. eye gaze for like five minutes. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. You yeah. know, 2011, 2012, just sitting there with a stranger and like looking into one another's eyes and like not like not breaking eye contact and, you know, but mm. it's like anything with, with, with practice, you get more comfortable. Exactly. Right. And like the things that, that used to be way outside your comfort zone, you start getting more acclimated to, and, and then you can do that with, with your partner more readily. Yeah. You know, I love so how was it for you after practice, after you completed that five minutes, how did it feel? It felt very vulnerable. I realized that a lot of it was a lot of it was my uh, discomfort with being vulnerable at the time, and mm. I've I've had to like practice, you know, taking down my shield and my guard, and and you, you have to like, for someone to really feel comfortable with you, you have to have your heart open and yeah. be willing to put yourself out there and and maybe get hurt. It's almost like you can't love unless you're willing to maybe get hurt. You can't fully love, you know, and, and fully express vulnerability. So it was super helpful for me to, to be like, put your guard down a little bit, brah, you know, and then yeah, start doing that exactly. with other people. And, and, and even when like I go out in social situations, I try to approach it from a, a, a place of, yes, you can still be strong and masculine, but you can also be engaged in a conversation very vulnerably. You know, mm -hmm. and where where the person you're talking to feels safe and they feel comfortable expressing things to you that maybe they wouldn't share with other people. And I think that's how you can also have like really, really deep and meaningful conversations where it's like I hate the I abhor those conversations where it's all just surface level because no one wants yeah. to be vulnerable and talk about anything that matters. So it's like I'd much rather dive into something, something deep and meaningful and vulnerable quickly. And I feel like life's more, more rich that way, you know? Yeah, I'm the same. And I think um, Matthew Hasse said it brilliantly that um, when you, when you trust someone or when you build a romantic relationship, um, you don't put your trust in them never hurting you. You put mm -hmm. your trust in yourself surviving it if they, if they do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a, that's a mindset shift to many because there is so much fear of abandonment, fear of rejection um, when people are dating and in relationships and, and that's a source of insecurity. But then you realize like, wait a minute, I can, I can never own another person. They, they choose to be with me. Mm -hmm. and, but if they choose not to be with me, that's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. I'm going to be okay. And then the next time I know myself better and I can create a relationship that's, that's better for me. Mm -hmm. And I think um, if people change their mindset, mindset around that, I think that can really help with the vulnerability aspect 
mm-hmm. in entering relationships or you know sharing even just sharing with friends yeah and, that, and can, a, that could be very difficult to many to open sure. up in any yeah. context can you say that quote one more time because i think it's i think it's pretty important oh i'm not sure if i remember it word for word but uh, like cl- um, the, the you, you don't put your trust in other people not hurting you but you put your trust in yourself being okay if they do mm-hmm. or surviving it if they do yeah that's that's great and also a recognition that this is not someone from your past exactly this this isn't you know this isn't your mother this isn't your father this isn't your ex yes this is this is someone new and they deserve to be uh treated as such you know each relationship is different and each relationship is a chance to start fresh and for it to be something more closely uh, aligned with with what you have intended for your partnerships. Exactly. And I mean, all relationships are different. If we have this mindset that, um, okay, this person is my one and only, mm-hmm. that's going to shift your, um, let's say, your perspective on mm-hmm. approaching that relationship. But, you know, there's, there's so many different ways to have meaningful connections with people. Some can be very short interactions, but they can be very meaningful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then some are longer. And uh, I love how people say it's like, you know, people are chapters in your in your book. And mm-hmm. then some are shorter, some are longer. And um, but you need to know yourself to to decide who gets to. Walk, you, mm. walk with you or beside you the long way. Yeah. And, and a recognition that a lot of those relationships are a, a, a sacred mirror where they're, exactly. they're showing mm. us something about ourselves at that point in time. And we can learn something from, from everyone and especially the people that we choose to be physically, emotionally, mentally exactly. vulnerable with. Beautiful. Um, Anna, where can people stay up to date with things you're working on? Um, if, you know, if they wanted to work with you in some capacity, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, right now, the best way to contact me is via Instagram. So at heal with Anna, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can contact me there. I started sharing some informative content that can help people create safe and healthy connections with themselves and, and others. Um, and I, I'm fully like when it comes to therapy, I'm fully booked, um, this year, but I have some openings for next year. So Mm -hmm. you can contact me about that also. Beautiful at heal with Anna on Instagram. Yeah. And I'm also working on some pretty, pretty cool projects that'll, um, air next year. So you can also stay tuned for them. Bye, well, Anna, yeah. thank you. This has been a this has been a fun conversation. Okay. I've appreciated it. Hopefully, you guys have enjoyed it, and uh, we'll have to have you back in the future when uh, yeah. when it makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was fun.